The Seventh Tower by Garth Nix. Book Six, The Violet Keystone. Chapter 28. They came out of the row row an hour later, blinking in the sunshine. All had globes of green light around their heads, and Mullen kept flinching slightly as warmth flowed in waves out of the sunstone on her finger and onto her skin. Tao was surprised to see hundreds of Kirschkin massed in the field in front of them. As they emerged, the lizards gave a deep-throated cry and waved their bows in the air. "'What is this?' asked Mela as four Kirschkin advanced bearing an ornately carved stone box between them. They knelt before her and offered her the box. "'We are returning something,' said Zika. "'Please open the box, Mela." Mila lifted off the lid and handed it to some more Kirschkin, who rushed forward. Her hand hovered above the box, an expression of surprise and wonder fleeting across her face before it was suppressed, as she tried to suppress all signs of emotion. "'What is it?' asked Tal, craning his neck. Mila didn't answer, but she reached in and pulled out a small, shining nail of violet crystal, the twin to the one she already wore. Mila slipped it onto the forefinger of her right hand and felt the band constrict and become secure. The other talon of Danir, whispered Mullen in awe. One Danir gave to Ramelin, said Yazik. The other she gave into our care. Now we give it back to her daughter's daughter's daughter unto the fortieth generation. It is a good omen, declared Mila, holding her hands up in the air so that both talons caught the sun glittering violet and gold. Now we go to slay Shadakor. The Kirschkin shouted and drummed their paws, sending water splashing up around them in bold fountains. Mila and Tao led the way down an avenue between splashing and shouting Kirschkin, out to the field where they had landed, and where a space was being kept for the recreation of the flying boat of light. Are you sure you can make it by yourself? whispered Mila as Tao raised his hand and focused on his sunstone. Tal nodded and began to work. Soon the keel of the boat began to shimmer on the water, and ribs curved up and out. Planks of yellow started to weave through the ribs, and blue traces arched up into the sky, where they were grabbed by the waiting storm shepherds. Let's go, said Tal, without looking around. He had to keep most of his attention on the boat and his sunstone. When everyone was in, Tal changed the focus of the Keystone's power to lift the entire boat up as well as keep it together. With a lurch, the boat rose straight up into the sky before the Storm Shepherds were able to drag the traces taut and apply some horizontal force. Down below, the Kirschkin kept splashing and drumming long after the four heroes, the flying boat, and the Storm Shepherds had disappeared from sight. Then they began the process of evacuating Kirschkin Corner, to various bolt holes and refuges, for they were rational creatures and believed in hedging their bets. They were also lizards of their word, and they carried Ebbet with them. It was a long climb to the highest reaches of the atmosphere to get above the whirlwind that either was or cloaked the old camsel. It grew colder quickly, but their sunstones warmed them, and though the air grew thin, they were sustained by their green globes. Tal did not worry that they would not last, but he forgot about it as they continued to climb higher and higher, and they saw new and strange sights. First, they saw the world curve away beneath them, truly round. Then they broke through cloud and entered another world again, one where the ground beneath them was white and puffy and constantly changing. They rose above great bluffs of sculptured cloud and then through long wisps of white that could hardly be called clouds at all. Wind buffeted them mercilessly at some altitudes, only to die away completely as they continued to rise. In any case, the storm shepherds could work the wind to some degree and change both its direction and force. Any wind they could not master, they rose above or passed aside. Mila saw the old camsel first and pointed. From far away, it looked like a solid spire of stone, reaching up to the heavens through a permanent and very wide hole in the cloud layer, a great circle that declared a no-man's land around the whirlwind. Pass here at your peril, the space seemed to say. Cross the line and be eaten by the spinning wind. We are so high, and yet it stretches higher still, said Mela, and down in its heart lies Shadakor and our destiny. 
Her eyes were shining. Tao watched her, catching glimpses in between focusing on his sunstone. Truly, she was the war chief going into battle. He knew there was no such light in his eyes. He just felt scared. Scared that he would die, and scared that they would fail. That Sherikor would kill them, and go on to raise his army, return to the Dark World, and finish what he had started. Soon, shouted Audris. Higher, Tal! Higher! Mila, Crow, said Tal, trying to keep his voice as matter-of-fact as he could. Blue light into the keel, please. Mullen, you just keep yourself warm. Mila and Crow turned back from the bow where they had both been looking at the old camsole. They summoned blue light from their sunstones, sending it pouring into the keel. Tal reinforced it with violet, and the flying boat shot up sharply, easily keeping pace with the Storm Shepherd's own climb. Is it getting warmer? Mullen asked suddenly. Or am I getting better with my sunstone? Keeping warm with his sunstone was now so automatic for Tal that he had to concentrate to see how much warmth he was drawing from the stone. He was surprised to find that he wasn't using it at all, though he certainly had been lower down. It gets warmer for a while up this high, shouted Audris, but it will get colder again. We still have a long way to go. They climbed in silence for an hour or more then, and once again Tal began to be concerned about the green globes. Theoretically, the green glow could contain days' worth of air, but they were rarely used for more than an hour or two. If one of them failed now, it would be impossible to do anything. There had to be air around to compress it into the globe in the first place. They were close to the old camsole now, the bare patch in the clouds far below them. They were near enough to see that the whirlwind was not made of dark cloud, but solid particles, so that it appeared not gray, but black as night upon the ice. The whirlwind was made visible by dust and rocks and whatever else it had snatched up, all spinning furiously, far faster than the flying boat, or even the storm shepherds at their swiftest. Anything that it sucked in would be instantly destroyed. Flesh would be torn from bone. All moisture sucked from a magical cloud. Death would be instantaneous for human or storm shepherd. The whirlwind was broad at the top, Tal was relieved to see, but then it drew in closer and closer, funneling air down to what looked like a very narrow tube near the ground. Tal could only trust that the eye would be wide enough down there for them to get through without being ripped apart. Higher! shouted Andres, and once again the sunstone shone brighter and the flying boat lurched up. We're higher than the whirlwind! announced Mullen, who was looking over the side. We need to get quite a lot higher, said Tal, who had only just realized what they would have to do. Because when we dissolve the boat, the storm shepherds will have to swoop down and catch us before we get blown off track and sucked into... into that. He pointed over the side, and everyone snatched a brief look at the churning vortex of darkness. Ready! shouted Andres, as the boat passed the very center of the whirlwind, the top of the vortex, about five hundred stretches below. She and Andres kept the tension on the traces so that the wind could not blow the boat off station. This is it, then, said Tal. His throat was so dry, the words came out in a deep, Kershkin-like croak. His heart was hammering so fast, it felt like it was shifting position inside his chest. Tal, Mila, said Crow suddenly, as they all took deep breaths. If anything, if I don't survive, remember the Underfolk. Remember our freedom. I swear it, said Mila. Even her voice sounded strained and strange. I will remember, Tal whispered. Everyone ready? Audris? Address? Yes, yes, came the answer from Free Folk, Ice Carls, and Storm Shepherds. Go! shouted Tal. He fired a burst of violet that dissolved the boat of light around them, and suddenly they were falling, falling much too quickly toward the vortex, as the storm shepherds spun around and hurled themselves down as fast as they had ever flown.